Gary is an internationally celebrated nature writer, seed saver, conservation biologist at the University of Arizona, and sustainable agriculture activist who has been called the father of the local food movement by Mother Earth News. For his writing and collab collaborative conservation work, Gary has been honored with the MacArthur Genius Award, a Southwest Book Award, the John Burroughs Medal for Nature Writing, the Vavilov Medal, and Lifetime Achievement Awards for the Quivira Coalition and Society for Ethnobiology. He works most of the year as a research scientist at the Southwest Center of the University of Arizona and the rest as co-founder and facilitator of several food and farming alliances, including Renewing America's Food Traditions and Flavors Without Borders. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Napham. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to uh, Elizabeth and Chuck and Loretta for hosting me and to all of you for coming out. I hope we'll have a good discussion with this. I'm going to show some pretty pictures and uh, uh, give you some uh, hints of what, uh, not just what I'm working on, but our community is working on in southern Arizona that may be parallel to some things uh, that you're working on here. And I. I really go on the road to exchange ideas with uh, communities because many of us are in the same places with slightly different um, challenges. Our challenge is most often that we don't have any water or any soil to, to grow things with and those are minor handicaps but other than that we're, um, we're working on local and regional food systems that are healthy and resilient and equitable and just, just like many people here are. So. I'm uh, hopefully going to um, encourage you to ask questions anytime through this as well as at the end. So if you have something that you want to ask about, say, go into more detail about that, I'd be happy to do it. Um, just have a new book out with two dear friends of mine that's about farming and climate change. And I, although I could talk ad nauseum just about that topic and it's sprinkled in a few places here. Um, I really am um, much more interested in the larger question of what do we do about climate change? What, how do we design food systems that are um, capable of adapting to it and fulfilling all the other needs that we have in our community of community building, of bringing healthy, nutritious, affordable food to our kids and to our elders. And so rather than uh, just touting you know, the new book that I have out, I've really designed this to hopefully inspire uh, everyone to um, work at being co-designers of our food systems, that we need to all take that one on, that there's sort of an artistic creativity that goes into designing food systems just like if we were designing the landscape in our backyard or or our living room or uh, uh, a painting and that if we if we see that there's uh, something there that can both um, nourish us aesthetically as well as physically it may encourage more people to think that they could be part of that process of redesigning our food systems and of course one reason we need to redesign them is because of this climate change. It isn't something that's impending. It's already here. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into the reasons why, but I think many of you know them already. And I'm going to use this word almunia several times, which is an Arabic term that came into Spanish through the Moors. And it's really talking about, um, I think, a powerful idea. Now in this country, when we talk about agricultural experiment stations. We think of the federal government in collaboration with our state government doing this. Well, I think the horticultural program here, what you can do through being members of groups like the Home Orchard Society or TILTH is as much about this idea of taking back the notion that each of us need to be uh, plant introduction uh, promoters and plant evaluation promoters of native and adapted plants to our own food system. And so it means that we, we don't leave it to a few experts in the governments or land-grant colleges 
to provide us with the plant and food diversity that we want, but all of us are engaged in that, in taking observations on what works in our locality and how it tastes. And I think that's fun stuff. I think everyone uh, can find a role in that, so we'll talk about that too. Okay, let me see if I know how projectors work. Um, first of all, um, you know, it, it's always funny for a desert rat to come up here uh, to the Pacific Northwest to Salmon Nation because in ways you all are so far ahead of other regions of the world in identifying the regional foods that are special and bringing them into your restaurants and CSAs and farmers markets. Uh, uh, I would say that the, the local food movement didn't begin in California or, or with Alice Waters or back in the Boston area with Chef's Collaborative, but it began right here in this area, and that's why groups like Chef's Collaborative love coming to Portland area. They're, they had their first meeting here, and I think the next one uh, that the national group has is going to be here in the fall because this area has been pivotal to the whole growth of the, um, the local food movement. And again, I would like to correct that. I'm not really the father of the local food movement. I'm the weird uncle. Okay? My wife always says, there's something you haven't been telling me. Who's the mother? You know. Anyway, one thing is uh, uh, that this region has the most interesting mix of wild foods, not only mushrooms and berries, but shellfish and fish and, and other marine invertebrates as well, in the food system and on the plate, as well as great cultivated foods. And that balance is different here in the Pacific Northwest than any other region in the country. I mean, even in comparable climates on the East Coast, you don't have the richness that you have here. So there's something really, really wonderful about uh, the food biodiversity of the uh, Salmon Nation Pacific Northwest. And that comes not only from the incredible depth and richness of the native cultures here, but also the important contributions that, that immigrant cultures from the early Russians that came to this region to Actually, the weirdest one, I think, is the Spanish bringing up potatoes from South America straight up the West Coast to this area. And the, the potatoes uh, that the Clinket and, and uh, um, uh, other people have from Monterey Bay all the way up to Alaska, um, that, that they're still growing on uh, uh, First Nations lands are the only potatoes in North America that didn't go to Europe first and then come back to uh, the Americas. So they're really, really uh, wonderful. And the Ozat Macaw uh, potato that is now being um, featured in some Portland restaurants is one of the great examples of that. Um, but this great food diversity is not necessarily all in safe hands. Uh, about uh, five years ago, when we launched the Renewing America's Food Traditions uh, Alliance nationally, the first region where we got to work was here with uh, the great staff at EcoTrust and many of the other nonprofits <coughs> in the region and, and the terrific farmers and orchard keepers, some of whom just have an encyclopedic knowledge of all the fruits and vegetables that have been grown in the Northwest over the last uh, 50 to 100 years. And we did this little book that Oregon State Press, um, uh, I think, uh, distributes for EcoTrust. You can get it through their office or online. But um, of the 180 foods that are unique to the region um, that can't be found in other regions, either as stocks or varieties or species, um, half of those are now endangered in the sense that there's only one to three seed catalogs, nurseries, or for fish, hatcheries, and for, for wild species, plant nurseries, that um, offer them. And oftentimes when we trace back the stories about these, we find out that three seed companies, three seed catalogs may list it, but it's one grower that they're all depending on. Okay, And um, Chuck and I were talking a little bit today about how dramatically the nursery 
industry is changing. Uh, the Northwest probably has the most robust uh, set of private um, nurseries with great fruit trees and rootstocks and and uh, uh, vine crops. But 800 independently owned nurseries have been lost uh, from business uh, within the last 15 years as Home Depot uh, uh, lawn and garden shops that I call pseudo nurseries or, or uh, Walmart uh, garden shops or, or the ones associated with uh, chain hardware stores have um, uh, started selling plants, most of them that aren't really well adapted to this region, of course. But the sadder thing is that the incredible knowledge that nurserymen have always had that they offer to their customers um, isn't being transmitted, of course, by, by the young staff at a Home Depot. And if the average age of the American farmer uh, is 58, 59 years old, the average age of a good nurseryman is probably 69 or 79. And so all the knowledge that goes with the uh, uh, historic cherry varieties or, or pear varieties of this region is going out the window. It's not just the plants themselves. <clears throat> well, why care about this? Well, because that food diversity that is still around the Northwest and that is celebrated by your best chefs here um, is being impacted in some really remarkable ways by climate change. Um, already, think about this, that, that a place like Central Valley of California that had half of its acreage in stone fruits after in the foothills around the valley in, uh, after World War II is now down to about 5% of its acreage in orchards or even suitable for orchards because of climate change high temperatures in the summer and not enough chill hours during the winter. And the predictions are that within uh, 40 years, there'll be no uh, fruit production left in the fruit basket of California. About 80% of the wine grapes grown in the area where I live in southern Arizona won't be able to be grown there for in another 20 years because they're already at their temperature uh, optima. And, and the wine growers in our, or grape growers in our area know this and they're uh, trying out a lot of other varieties and getting some really interesting results. So it's not all a bad story to switch uh, varieties, but what I'm saying is it, it's, it's taking, it's restructuring our, where our food is grown and how it's grown. People are trying different techniques, putting their rows in different directions than they had in the past and a lot of other things. But it's a a major concern because um, most of the environmental organizations in this country actually see agriculture as not only being vulnerable to climate change, but a driver of climate change, or at least our food system is. At 46% of the Americans' carbon footprint is our food print. And ironically, from my perspective, it's not the production of the food that's causing those carbon emissions, but what we do with it once it leaves the farm and ranch gate. That there's tremendous use of fossil fuels at every stage after the harvest too, from storing, doing cold storage to putting it on a truck or a railroad car that goes halfway across the country. Railroad cars, of course, use far less um, uh, fossil fuel than, uh, or that's embedded in it than, than uh, trucking. but you know, all the way through watering salad greens eight to ten times a day before they reach our, our plates. There's a lot of energy and water embedded in our food at every stage. And so how we deal with that means that we have to really redesign how food moves from farm to table. And there's some interesting experiments, of course, in this area uh, that does that. So if we're going to reduce the rate of climate change, it really means figuring out ways to take the fossil fuel and fossil groundwater, particularly in our region, out of our food system and replacing it with renewables. And um, this is going to take some major efforts. Uh, I think it's a challenge as serious as getting um, 
people to the moon that it's going to take that much scientific ingenuity and public creativity. So the need to redesign our food systems has never been greater, but we've not said to, you know, uh, Sally Farmer or Joe Sixpack or whoever, hey, you're a co-designer of your food system. This is too important to, to leave up to um, experts. We all need to be involved in it. And it may take some skills that we don't typically see in the farm community or in the agribusiness food distribution community. That people who are landscape architects, artists, architects that know about collaborative design processes may be as valuable to be as uh, part of this redesign of our food systems as the, the food producers and chefs themselves. And I'll talk about some examples of that kind of thing in a moment particularly in the kind of dry climates that you have in eastern Oregon all the way down to where I live in the stinking hot desert of Arizona, we really need a redesign of our food systems, not just the on-farm ones, but the food distribution and delivery. So I did a book about 10 years ago called Coming Home to Eat, and what that's really about is our communities taking responsibility for our food security safety and sustainability rather than thinking that the government will do it or that Cisco Foods should design how um, uh, what food gets to our cafeterias or Sodexo should be the sole uh, company thinking about how food moves across the country or that we should just do everything that Cargill and Monsanto suggest that we do. They should be part of the picture but they shouldn't be the whole picture. And even the Farm Bureau that says it represents uh, the American farmer is now fairly um, resistant to talking about climate change adaptation as a positive thing where other groups like uh, Rural Voices for Conservation Action um, that began in Oregon, I believe, is taking that one on and saying, yeah, if farmers don't become part of that process, we will inevitably lose out because other people will be designing our food systems without us. So many uh, uh, grassroots farm organizations are on this topic where the Farm Bureau is hoping that it goes away. It's not going to go away. And so the big message is that you all are the future designers of our food systems. And all the students going through the HORT program here are probably key to that uh, evolution. And it means that we have to change our education structure so that we get students out into the fields, into the food sheds, rather than thinking that you can absorb all of this off the internet or from books. And the hands-on kind of education that you have here at this college, I think, is exemplary of the skill set that we need for, for people, that, that this can be a training center for how to adapt uh, uh, our food systems in the face of climate change that will be incredibly important to the economy and the ecology of this region, to the not just to the wealth but to the well-being of the residents of this area because it's bridging that uh, theoretical knowledge of horticulture with the pragmatics of making it work on the ground. And so um, this term climate friendly food systems I think is more than just jargon. We have to figure out ways to start adaptations now because with say apple trees or pear trees we have to plan 20 to 40 years out. We can't just rip a tree out 20 years from now and say oh the climate's changed by two and a half degrees and put something else in and expect to, to produce an apple the next day. So it really means thinking about the future of our food systems on the 20 to 50 uh, year time range minimum and probably on the century to millennium scale would be better. Um, so I want to get back to this um, idea that I, I've seen in Andalusia, Spain of private agricultural experiment stations. <laughs> and I should say that unlike my friend um, 
uh, Joel Salatin, who I spoke with in Vancouver, Washington a few weeks ago, who says everything I do is illegal, uh, that I'm not I'm not a 100% libertarian like I want government out of my life. I appreciate what government does. I've benefited from it. I feel it's a way that communities can offer uh, a voice about their needs. But I also think we can't let the government do anything and that more of these private experiment stations or collaborative ones like the Home Orchard Society uh, uh, planning here on campus is exactly the direction we need to go in terms of um, setting up gardens that will help decide the mix of fruits or vegetables that we should be planting over the next few decades. So I want to give you an example of how we're doing this um, down in the stinking hot desert of Arizona where I, where I live. Um, because in some ways our situation looks incredibly poignant and pathetic. Uh, <laughs> Um, we've had a tough year in Arizona with the near assassination of our congresswoman with, with incredible controversy over immigration law. And all of these things have affected the health and, and, and uh, security of our, of our food system in ironic ways. 380,000 um, Mexican farm workers, legal and illegal, have left Arizona since last time this year because of our immigration laws. And um, we've had about $500 million of conferences and conventions cancel uh, because of um, the, the immigration debate in Arizona. I'm not uh, taking sides so much or trying to convince you of a particular view because it's very complex. But on top of the economic downturn, we've had incredible um, um, insults to our uh, food system in particular. And I think this quote from Fred Kersman is particularly poignant. Now change in our food system is coming whether we want it or not. So the question is uh, not about, um, you know, uh, whether we should accept that change is happening, but whether we're going to be packed, passive victims of it or creative active players. And so whether it's rural land loss or energy and water scarcity or climate change, um, there's ample reason to really start restructuring the way uh, our food moves from uh, the soil to the table. So um, Arizona is already among the three worst states in poverty. We're just above Mississippi. Uh, we're in the top six in terms of child food insecurity, obesity, and diabetes for kids under 18. We, uh, the four border states together, California, particularly Southern California through Texas, account for one quarter of all the farmland loss in the country, about six million acres since 1985, because our eyes aren't on the ball about these problems. We think they're gonna go away and they're not. And these have given us incredible motivation for redesigning our food system, whether it's sanctioned by the state government or not. And I want to go into some of the changes that are happening. We just did a report called State of Southwestern Food Sheds where we compared progress in Arizona to New Mexico. New Mexico state government has been much more prone to uh, sort of food security, positive legislation and task forces. It has a lot more uh, foundations that pump money into uh, uh, food system change in Arizona. But even so, we've seen a 15% increase in farmers markets. We have one of the top 10 farmers markets in the country uh, that's uh, been started by a community food bank that also has a, uh, a gleaning program of all the urban fruit as well as a 15 acre uh, uh, farm that's taking uh, partially employed people and, and creating a workforce of them in um, providing fresh food for the food bank. We've seen exponential growth in CSAs, so we've eclipsed New Mexico and other adjacent states in the number of uh, CSAs in the state. Um, uh, almost a, a, a new local food restaurant uh, every month, and they're almost in every county of Arizona now. Um, the idea of food hubs and processing plants to <coughs> restore the infrastructure that we've lost over the last 50 years in terms of meat processing and 
community kitchens. It's coming back, a new community kitchen opened in Tucson. A new meat processing plant is opening with, in Flagstaff through a public-private partnership within the next couple months. And lots and lots of farm to cafeteria programs, both at the high school and the college level, but primarily the community colleges uh, like this one are really taking this uh, as part of their things. They're much more easy to maneuver than the big food systems in the state universities. <coughs> and then finally, um, there's another kind of restoration of the food system happening, which is about the biodiversity in the food system that we're dependent upon. We've had a tremendous loss of honeybees in Arizona um, over the last 15 years, and now we're we're uh, launching next week uh, a pollinator restoration project that will include a 20-mile corridor where I live through farms and ranches and another four-mile corridor about 30 miles away that we think will be eventually a five-river um, uh, corridor uh, pollinator restoration project in an area where we have about 600 to 1,000 native bees, 14 species of hummingbirds, doves, nectar feeding bats, and about 300 uh, kinds of butterflies that are important for pollinating our crops, our forage plants, and all of that. So the restoration is not just of our food distribution and delivery system, but the on-farm infrastructure of, our, of the ecosystem services that we need to keep farming healthy. Oops, where did that come from? You go away. One second. So let's return to this idea of being co-designers for farming systems. Um, uh, we need them more resilient, more responsive, equitable, and just. And we've just gotten word this week that the Kellogg Foundation is helping us with a 10-year minimum investment in um, making our food systems more sustainable in the borderlands. One way to do that is reducing our carbon food prints through reducing food miles, but doing many things in addition to just worrying about food miles. That's just one part of the picture. Getting more um, uh, renewable energy to uh, fuel water pumping and water transfer on farms and ranches, using wind power, uh, using um, uh, uh, local food hubs for redistribution and many other things. We're doing a huge effort on edible tree crops and succulents that are not just adapted to the desert heat, but some of our desert cities have increased 10 degrees Fahrenheit in nighttime summer temperatures since World War II. So the urban heat island effect that we get in places like Phoenix and Las Vegas it has ramped up the, the climate change even more than the global climate change. So in ways, our desert cities are the harbingers of what we'll all have to face in the future. And I was just at a great urban horticulture conference at uh, Huntington Botanical Gardens in LA, where in all places LA is taking this issue on and trying to make um, LA uh, a center for training people from desert cities around the world on how to adapt to climate change. And then I'm big because I don't believe in silver bullets that we need one miracle climate ready crop like uh, some of the big plant breeders are proposing that at this time of climatic uncertainty we need hundreds of varieties out in the landscape being tested and evaluated on all these private uh, experiment stations and that that's the only way to buffer against uh, ourselves against climate uncertainty certainty to have bed hedging strategies in the way we irrigate, in the variety of plants that we grow, and in the variety of markets that we're putting them into. And the, the bottom line for me is that the food systems have to have culturally appropriate foods available and affordable to the range of cultures um, that, that live in our communities now. That if there's people who are lactose intolerant or gluten intolerant, we need to figure out ways to find them foods that can be locally grown that fit their cultural and nutritional needs. 
So that means democratizing the food system design process. And this is where we need to learn from the collaborative design processes the landscape architects and architects have used in design charrettes for decades. I mean, we, we, we have to get smart about how we make design inclusive rather than exclusive. Like, you know, it's just not going to be the kind of scenario where a Frank Lloyd Wright of food systems pops up and designs great food systems for the country. It's going to be all of us working together. And there's three strategies that I can think of for coming up with some novel designs for our food systems in addition to taking a lot of hallucinogens and seeing what appears before your eyes. Uh, one is um, using the design principle of uh, biomimicry. In the session that I had with students today, uh, someone brought up Jeanette Banyas's uh, wonderful book on bio mimicry and, and we found that one biological principle of boundary layers that plants have all these weird fuzzy hairs and and things that keep the sun from hitting their photosynthetic tissue by having this layer out about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch from the plant skin the epidermis can be mimicked in buildings and we're seeing that kind of uh, strategy even being used by the architects in the School of Architecture at our university where they have living green walls uh, on trellises about a foot and a half out from the real walls of the building and they're actually condensing, uh, getting the condensation off the windows and funneling that down without ever irrigating the, the, the vines that are climbing up four stories high um, passively rather than than having to irrigate those plants. They're just growing with the condensation uh, that, that accumulates in the building itself. So these boundary layers reduce heat loads on walls, um, keep the air fresher and greener, uh, um, and um, they're, they're a biological principle that thousands of plants use. Why aren't we using them? Now go away again. I've told you about that. Let's see. Okay, whoops, so I'm going the other direction. That happened quick. Okay, the next thing is, is eco-mimicry, and that's looking at the structure of natural ecosystems in our region and how the structure of the vegetation can tell us something about the clusters of plants that we should grow together in guilds. Uh, plant guilds is a concept that both ecologists use and permaculture designers use. And so in the, the desert where I live, virtually nothing um, germinates out in the open. They all, all the wildflowers and cacti germinate under these nurse plants, just like in the tropics. Coffee grows under Madre Cacao, the mother of chocolate tree. Well, in the desert, all of our germination begins in what we call dark gaps that are like the light gaps that you have here in the the temperate um, uh, uh, rainforests of the Cascades where, where your plants need light, our plants need darkness and moisture and high organic matter that they get from these nurse plants and that's where we get all the germination. So we're designing multiple strata food systems and I have about two acres of this already planted at my uh, house um, where, where we're combining nitrogen fixing uh, uh, vines with with overstory plants that provide shade with other ones that are pumping nutrients and water up from higher I mean from lower elevations and other things that are adding to the soil fertility in a cluster so we don't think of the desert as being a multiple strata system like a rainforest but it is it's just shorter you know I mean some of you guys are really effective and you're short well that's how the desert ecosystems are too we're just short little guys and then the third um, uh, concept is sort of a cultural mimicry, a cultural emulation to generate the uh, multiple uses for the same plants that are growing in a shared space. And I won't go as, in as much detail as this, but we can take concepts from the indigenous cultures of each region on how to live there and how to utilize plants and, and emulate that. We can't be Indian wannabes, but we can honor their knowledge and their thought process and learn to apply it to 
to the the challenges that we're facing today, hopefully with respect and and honoring their contributions to to our food systems. So here's just an example. There's a lot of work going on in cities like Tucson and Phoenix and Los Angeles and Las Vegas about how we bring urban farms back into places that look initially like they're light limited because there's all these damn you know, five to ten story buildings around. So how do you design a food system that's sort of vertically stratified that can take being in shade part of the day and full sun in the other part of the day? Well, palm trees figured this out a long time ago. Date palms as well as the wild Washingtonia palms that you even see up the coast into Oregon. And so you, looking at the structure of those uh, vertically integrated um, uh, natural habitats can give us some insights on how to design um, uh, food systems for these skyscraper ridden uh, metro areas and there's rapid growth of urban farms all over the country of course. But the key thing I think is that it's going to take a whole different mix of people working together, scientists and artists together, uh, uh, dirt farmers and physicists working together, climatologists and chefs. And the most interesting project I know of uh, like this is called the Window Farms Project, um, which um, reminds me a little bit of the um, living walls I saw with Chuck at, what's the name of the restaurant? Singer Hill Cafe today. It's a little bit like that, except they're using completely recycled materials and having these um, um, uh, uh, window farms run up the, the um, stairway corridors in 15 to 20 story buildings. Brett, Britt O'Reilly got a, a design institute degree a few years ago and she got real excited by the idea of design labs and collaborative design and got together with a few friends, formed a new, new nonprofit, said why don't we use recycled plastic water bottles and cut little wedges in those and put little Dixie cups in them and, and plop mint plants and basil plants in those and then have water trickle through whole corridors of these that are linked together so that a nutrient solution trickles down through these and have solar run pumps pump the water to the top and or the nutrient solution back down. Now she has design teams that are working on the, the best, most cost efficient nutrient slurries to pump through these systems. Other people working on the filtering systems so that it doesn't get clogged. Others doing uh, experiments to see which herbs, salad greens, fruits and vegetables are adapted to growing in such little space. It's a, basically a glorified hydroponic system, but some of these are 10 stories tall. And they're using space that's never been used for food production before. So 17,000 people were using this by last September, she was on Oprah Winfrey and Martha Stewart in the month after that. So it's probably well over 50,000 people trying these out. Whole schools are doing it. 1,200 designers are helping her refine this process. And this is what some of them look like. This is the early stages. The design innovations in this system are growing exponentially because 1,200 people to 1,500 people are having input on it every week, every week now. It's all a cyber network of food system designers. So it's, it's sort of this amazing thing that rather than emphasizing the individual hero as designer like a Frank Lloyd Wright or a Thomas Jefferson, we're saying, let's get us all involved and we have completely different skills. I'm a, I'm a, a soil nutrient geek and I can help you with a nutrient slurry, but don't talk to me about the aesthetic aspects. Talk to my wife who's an artist. So that's what's cool about this. So what if we had quilters design mosaics of annual and perennial plantings that are integrated with our urban shelters? And that's what's happening at a place near uh, my house called uh, Avalon Gardens, where, where the buildings are designed as if food is going to be grown on the walls and in the, the doorways and, and uh, uh, in the uh, spaces where the, the rainwater falls and vice versa, the plants are selected to enhance the building qualities. Now the same process are, are needed for the redesign of food transport and delivery systems. We've just gotten 
of all things, a humanities council grant to do what we're calling the uh, taco diplomacy food wagon uh, that will feature foods that are in shared traditions across the U.S.-Mexican border. And as you go up to the little mobile food wagon, you'll see videos of not just the farmers and ranchers who grew the food, but the brokers and the distributors and the truck drivers and the, the uh, people who peel the vegetables and, and grill them. All the way through, you'll see the whole food chain daylighted right in front of your eyes as you come up and get food from this. Go away. So, you know, what I do as part of these teams is think about the food diversity, that, that we, we can't really deal with this uncertainty without drawing on the diversity of, of foods and approaches and cultural uh, uh, strategies that, that have accumulated on this continent over the last uh, 4,000 years of agriculture in North America. And yet we need a diversity of approaches to making this food palatable and edible and beautiful and nourishing too, that, that uh, no food channel chef is going to be able to guide us into all of this diversity. We need just as many people thinking about how to prepare it as how to produce it. And we need to think about protecting, restoring, and enhancing our food sheds just like Every state and county government thinks about our watersheds that way now. Why aren't we doing this for our food system? Why do we have a World Wildlife Fund that works on the conservation of biodiversity, but they kind of ignore food diversity, the f diversity of the living world that we're most dependent on? We need hundreds of organizations working on heirloom vegetables and fruits just like they're working on pandas and condors and eagles and, and polar bears. So with um, those outrageous demands and, and uh, 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 radical uh, uh, recommendations and I suppose a few condemnations, I'm going to leave you with a prayer. Know where your food comes from through knowing those who produced it for you, from farmer to forager, rancher or fisher, to earthworms building a deeper, richer soil, to the heirloom vegetable, the nitrogen-fixing legume, the pollinator, the heritage breed of livestock, the sourdough culture rising in your flower. Know where your food comes from by the very way that it tastes. It's freshness telling you how far it may have traveled. The hint of mint in the cheese suggesting what the goat has eaten. The terroir of the wine reminding you of the lime in the stone that you stand upon so that you can stand up for the land that has given it to you. Know where your food comes from by the richness of stories told around the table, recalling all that was harvested nearby during the years that came before you when your predecessors and ancestors roam the very same woods and neighborhoods where you and yours now roam. Know them by the songs sung to praise them, by the handmade tools kept to harvest them, by the rites and the feasts held to celebrate them, by the laughter let loose to show them our affection. Know where your food comes from by the patience displayed while putting them up while peeling, skinning, coring, or gutting them, while canning, salting, or smoking them, while arranging them on the plate for our eyes to behold. Know where your food comes from by the slow savoring of each and every morsel by letting their fragrances lodge in your memory, reminding you of just exactly where you were the very day that you first became blessed by each of their distinctive flavors. Now, when you know where your food comes from, you can give something back to those lands and waters, that rural culture 
that migrant harvester, curer, smoker, poacher, or vintner. You can give something back to that soil, something fecund and fleeting like compost, or something lasting and legal like protection. We as humans have not been given roots as obvious as those of plants. The surest way that we have to lodge ourselves within this blessed earth is by knowing where our food has come from. Thank you very much. Um, some questions, I guess, and then we'll go back out and have some one-on-ones. Yes? Well, the, the model that I am hoping that may work is something like the watershed councils that many places in the Northwest have already developed for restoration of the streams, for um, making sure that there's less soil loss and pollution of the streams, for rational management so that farmers and ranchers and other people get water during times of drought. And so we need an office of the food shed in every county. We need we need uh, food policy councils. We've just started one in Pima County uh, that I participate in in Arizona. And it, it's, it's the most heartening and heartbreaking um, gathering that I've ever been in. Uh, the first time there were three ranchers who have never been invited, I mean, you know, to a meeting in an urban setting to talk about the connection. They do a lot of talking about their good ranching practices. But the city was basically saying, uh, we need to design our food system to take your values and needs into account. And that had never happened before. There was a woman who um, was homeless, who um, basically house sits, n not even houses, but, but stables for people that are on vacation. She travels around the Southwest with a donkey and six ducks trying to find places to stay where she can keep her animals with her. She's lost her family, and these animals are her family. And she was there to repre represent the homeless in redesigning the food system. She found out about the meeting on a bulletin board. And I, it once you start this, even if it's six people in the room the first time, it will grow. Yes. I always remember Wallace Stegner's line about people moving from the east to the west need to get over their color of green. You know, that if they expect their yard to look green all the time like it does back in, in Maryland, they may be asking the wrong thing. So if we want strawberries year-round in Portland or, or Tucson, we're probably asking too much of our food system. But boy, do we need canners and smokers and and all of that. And canning classes are going through a revival. I mean, I, I set up a whole canning kitchen that I use as a seed germination place in the spring, then break it all down and have all these weird blenders and cores and cure my olives and do all my, my fermented foods in there. And so w that is a great way to reduce carbon uh, footprints. We can recycle the glass, you know, we boil water. What else do we do? I mean, we're, we're letting the foods last year round rather than expecting them to come to us from Chile. I think that's a bit pretty good trade-off. Yeah, and you should get, be able to get it from the farmer's market. And as you may know that our food safety system in this country is going through convulsions right now. I've heard everyone from the largest farmer to the smallest farmer's market gardener complain about the new food safety laws that they're prohibiting uh, home prepared foods in some places. And so um, several counties um, in the United States have just declared food sovereignty that, that uh, uh, issues saying anything produced here that's traceable back to the producer can be grown here and you simply have to state the food safety conditions that you utilized and let the consumer decide whether that's enough for them. And so there's this remarkable movement that's happening in three or four states of, of um, people saying the, the laws have become too restrictive. We can't have a 
food sample of a of an apple offered to to someone in a farmer's market because then it becomes a prepared food that you need a food handler's license for. To put a slice of an apple on a toothpick, you need a food handler's uh, license. There are some other means that we can go about ensuring food safety rather than these draconian things that some people fear are coming from industry that are now seeing the local food movement getting so large that it's cutting into their profits. I'm not that paranoid. I want us to live with all scales of agriculture, but I do want to see farmers markets uh, thrive. Right, so many parts of the country have these farm incubator programs where young uh, farmers are placed on farms to help older farmers and actually transition, and that's working in Burlington, Vermont, and counties in New Mexico and many other places now. And I think it's a key issue because those, we used to say, well, that area is going to be developed anyway. The, the, the chances that that farm is going to survive very long in an urban setting is low. And so we just let it go under asphalt too. And now those farms are ever more precious because we know there's demand for fresh produce at a local farmer's market that can't get enough vendors so that, that we were writing off all that land as losable was just silly. Yeah, so there's, there's several different models. Um, one is that some um, community lending organizations are helping uh, a young farmer actually purchase a farm with community partners. So the, the farmer is just one stockholder of many to keep the land in open space. We've also had a thing where in our county uh, that did a comprehensive conservation plan that said we have to save all the remaining farm and ranch land from being developed. Um, the county's buying the farms and then leasing them back to, to uh, people who bid on running the farms. And it can be the original owner who's basically been bought out and has to meet, meet some conservation objectives in addition to what she or he had done before. But then when that person retires, the, the loan becomes available. Uh, a, play, a thing called the rural, well, no, the, just a second, it's on the tip of my tongue. The Countryside Conservancy outside of Cleveland has done this now for 25 years of using uh, farmlands that were in the pathway of development of bringing that in as public lands and then renting them back to young farmers. And it's an incredibly successful program that's now providing um, uh, farmers markets, food to restaurants and to other uh, special events in the Cuyahoga River National Park or Monument, whatever it's called there. So, so there's some very good models about how to do this, but it's very different in each locality. Over here, because um, that's what my whole imagination is wrapped up in now. Um, I live above this native seed search farm that grows about 180 varieties of heirloom vegetables, corns, and beans, uh, some of which have been there since prehistoric times and that were donated by Native American communities, other things that came in with this Spanish, Sephardic Jews, and Moors that settled uh, northern Mexico then after the Spanish Inquisition. So my orchard has 50 varieties of tree crops, including about 30 varieties that came in with uh, um, in the Spanish mission era, Mission Olives, Mission Figs, which are grown in California, Mission Grapes, uh, Santa Barbara Mission Pears, pomegranates and figs from the same area, quinces, and then I, because I'm a, a Middle Eastern dude, that's why I write terrorist manifestos. Uh, I, uh, I also um, uh, grow a lot of heirlooms from uh, the Middle East, uh, uh, other varieties of quinces, camel hair quince and, and uh, Armenian and Lebanese cucumbers and Syrian tomatoes that are from a comparable climate as ours. And then I grow, I use the native mesquite and agaves and prickly pears. So my, my hillsides are terraced above the floodplain with perennial succulents and, and native tree crops. And we have a community 
mesquite grinding mill that we're working on so that people can use both the mesquite pod flour for chicken feed and for human feed. So there's a completely different set of plants than what you might draw in here. It is not true, as Barbara Kingsolver is wrong, that I only eat roadkill. I do eat things besides roadkill and chilies. Um, sometimes I eat roadkill chilies, but I, I think roadkill options should be available for vegetarians as well. Yeah. The multiple strata, yeah. Okay, so things like chilies now only need about 40% of the ambient sunlight that they get during the, the day, according to some studies. So we use, basically use this nurse plant thing, and this is what Egyptian oasis gardeners have been doing for you know, millennia, where they may have date palms or olive trees as very tall trees, and then things like peaches or apricot trees or figs or pomegranates, almost as, as shrubs rather than trees beneath them. And then grapevines on horizontal trellises rather than vertical trellises so that the, the inner spaces between the trees have grapevines growing on wooden trellises out 20 or 30 feet horizontally about uh, head height so that you can come by and easily pick them. And they may have mints, um, uh, asparagus, um, what else do I have? Uh, uh, artichokes growing underneath those things as well as things like chilies and tomatoes and basil and oreganos. And so I probably have about 150 species growing in these multiple strata gardens on the two acres of, uh, that I've already planted in the last 14 months. Yeah. Um, that's uh, been my burning passion the last few months. Uh, we did a report that was released in February called State of Southwestern Food Sheds. It's on a bunch of lines at uh, uh, websites. And the showstopper for us was a report in December by the National Academy of Sciences that said that um, the, the Sun Belt of the West has already reached its water sustainability limit. We're not moving toward it. We're there. And that for cities and agriculture to survive in the, the Sun Belt, we're going to have to get our water use down to 40 percent, excuse me, 60 percent of what it's now. We're going to have to drop it 40 percent from the current levels. Over the last quarter century, farmers have only increased their water use efficiency about 20%. So this, in a relatively short period of time, is has to double that efficiency again. And the low-hanging fruit of how to do that, like switching to drip irrigation from furrow irrigation, has largely been done. Said that if the cities of the Southwest double in size again, like Las Vegas and LA and Phoenix have multiple times in the last century. If they were ever to double in size again, there would be no water in our rivers at all for wildlife or recreation. And the relevance to you all is the dirty little secret that all our river systems are connected now so that when when uh, the Col Columbia River doesn't have a drought, but California does, there's all these water shunning plans to, to connect the watersheds. We have water going over from the Rio Grande watershed to the Colorado River and vice versa depending on where the routes hit. So the, the west is all these interconnected water engineering uh, uh, systems now and, and that affects not only what water is available to farmers here but also the energy production in your dams. All of this stuff is completely interconnected. You can't untie water and energy uh, production and consumption anywhere in the West anymore. We, we actually have these really stupid canals that were planned in the 40s that bring water 350 miles over to Tucson. And when I finally got there, what, about 12, 14 years ago, the farmers all said, we don't want to use this water. It's too salty. It tastes like a margarita. I mean, I'm not going to put that on my crops. And so it's actually then <laughs> they've, they've spent billions of dollars to bring it over from the Colorado River. They put it back in the ground to um, uh, replenish the groundwater reserves that we've also squandered. 
in less than 100 years, we've gone through 90% of the groundwater reachable by, by pumping. So this is a completely unsustainable system. You know, we can't even talk about local food in parts of Arizona because water is coming in from either 350 miles away or from, from 10,000 years ago in a well. And the energy, of course, is coming in from fossil fuel from about 15 countries. What's local about food produced with those kind of exotic inputs? I, I think to some extent, I mean, I totally agree with you. And, and we've just gotten support to, to do a child food insecurity thing where we, we want the ch children to grow up knowing that they're the co-designers of these food systems. But I think you need alliances with the parents um, the, uh, in your schools. If they bring to the, to the parent-teachers meetings this issue and they say, this is as important to our kids as learning math or, or having uh, outdoor recreation. A playground isn't enough. These kids need a school garden so that they experience the, the process of, of seeing food grow and, and collecting food every day, even if it can't be used in the cafeteria, it can be used in the classroom. I, I think this is the essential task that we need to restructure our education system where every topic is taught through food rather than thinking that like food is something that girls should get in home economics classes when they turn 16 because they're going to be householders in two years or something like that. It's like turning that whole thing around where home economics means, you know, the ecology of our food system and that every kid goes through it. Yeah. And the farm, I mean, the chef to, the farmer to chef program uh, that several organizations sponsor here, the Chef's Collaborative local chapter, the programs through Eco, Eco Trust and its magazine, Edible Portland, are just tops in the country too. Anyway, I'll be happy to talk to you more outside. I'm grateful that you showed up. Think of yourselves of, as designers of delicious, nutritious, equitable food systems. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you.